without wasting much time, uh, Dr. Kevin from the entire team of Gnosis, it's an absolute pleasure and honor to have you today. As for the information of the of the participants, Dr. Uh, Kevin is an associate of the Department of South Asian Studies at Harvard University. His research centers on the Sanskrit uh, Sanskrit epic Mahabharata. He has published works uh, on Mahabharata such as the Sanskrit hero Karna in Epic Mahabharata from Real Publication 2004. Three Women in Epic Mahabharata, Harvard University Press, 2009. Jaya Performance in Epic Mahabharata, Harvard University, 2011. Heroic Krishna, Friendship in Epic Mahabharata, Harvard University Press, 2013. Arjuna Pandav, The Double Hero in Epic Mahabharata, Orient Blackstone, 2016. And the, and the number goes on and on. He is presently working on Bhishma Devrata, Authority in Epic Mahabharata. Uh, Dr. Magrath is also a poet in residence at Lowell House and his most recent publication is Eros. He has also published five previous books on poet of poetry including Supernature, Eroica and Windward. Magrath does field work in the Kutch of Western Gujarat and studies kinship, landscape and migration. Some of his material was recently published in the Kutch, a memoir of love and place. He also works in the field of water security in a desert region of the district. Dr. Uh, Magrath, on basis of on, on uh, the entire team of Gnosis, it's an absolute pleasure and honor to have you here, sir. And uh, I would also place on record, I would like to thank Dr. Soham, who has been, who has played a pivotal role in establishing a contact between you and me, between you and the entire team of Gnosis. So thank you very much. Thank you, participants, for joining us. We have more than 280 participants today. Uh, Dr. Magrath, the platform is all yours, sir. Aha, thank you so much, Dr. Banerjee and Dr. Soham. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us here today. And I hope this connection continues to be strong. So, <clears throat> what I would like to talk about is the Sanskrit epic Mahabharata. And because this is so removed, both in time and place from us, in time it is two and a half, three thousand years ago, and in place it is many thousand miles to your west and many, many thousand miles to my east. So if we're going to understand this poem, we have to read out of the poem. We cannot read into it. We cannot bring our Western or Asian 21st century ideas and thoughts to our understanding of the poem. We have to read very carefully and very closely and very slowly. That is, we have to be close readers. And in that respect, in that method, what we do is we look at very detailed points in the text and make inferences. And from those inferences, we develop hypotheses, which then we can express as arguments supported by evidence. That is what a close reader does. And because this poem is so far removed from anything that we know, not just geographically or in, in terms of time, but in terms of consciousness, it's very difficult to reconstruct what was actually happening in the poem or what is happening in the poem. And that is, we have to be humanists. And a humanist is someone who tries to understand what he or she is not. So that is for me, the art of reading. And what I'd like to do now is to just share with you a few of the concepts and methods, methods which I have engaged with over the years, the decades, as I have read this poem. Um, and what I'd like to do is just give a brief introduction and then talk about seven points of access, how we can actually enter into this late Bronze Age world, which is so far removed from anything that we know or are familiar with. So that is our project this evening. Narayanam namaskritya naram chaiva naruttamam devim sarasvatim chaiva tato jayam kudirayet. And that's the beginning of the poem. That's the first shloka, the first line. And what I'd like to look at is pada di, those three terms there. Tato Jayam Udirayet. Therefore, or so, one should declaim, one should pronounce Jaya. 
And as you know, Jaya means victory, triumph. But in terms of the poem, Jaya has a very specific reference and the poem refers to itself in its origins as the Jaya. And that Jaya is also known as the Bharata, which is composed according to the poem. And this is stated in the Adipavan, book one. The Bharata or the Jaya is composed of 24,000 verses. Now, what we have today is the great Bharata, the Mahabharata, and this is approximately 100,000 verses. So what, what distinguishes that, tra tra that transition? How are we going to understand that movement from the Bharata to the Mahabharata? That's one of our tasks today. Now, <clears throat> I said that this Bharata poem is long removed in time and experience from us, but actually somebody like Shashi Tharoor would paradoxically strongly assert that the Mahabharata is the charter myth of India today, of 21st century India. Um, that is, it is the founding narrative of India as we know it in the 21st century. And <clears throat> this poem, according to Dhritarashtra, the old king, who says, Sanjaya, tell me what happened in the poem. How did Beda happen? The poem is about Beda. Partition, division, civil war. That is the heart of the poem. That is what concerns the Bharata. So we need to look at that today. Now, I don't need to tell you that there is not simply one Bharata or Mahabharata, but there are many, many Mahabharatas. Um, and if you ask anyone in non metropolitan India today about the Mahabharata, well, they will talk about the 1980s Chopra television version, or perhaps the Star television version. But there are others. There are episodes which have been represented in prose novels. There are images on temples, sculptural or bas-relief images. There is cinema. There are village rituals. There are many Mahabharatas. There are the bar Mahabharata as it is staged in politics with the Ramyatra. There is uh, the Bharata in calendar art where you have heroes and heroines. There are many, many Mahabharatas. What I am going to focus on is our earliest version. And that is what we refer to as the PCE, the Pune Critical Edition. And this critical edition was assembled in the middle of the 20th century by a team at the Bandaka Oriental Institute in Pune, led by the great Vishnu Suktanka, whom for me is the genius of all Mahabharata scholars. I would like to be Suktanka. He is this magnificent man who knew more about this poem perhaps than anyone else. And when Suktanka and his team were assembling this poem, nowhere as they sent out their messengers to the various collections and libraries throughout India, nowhere did they find a complete text. There was no complete narrative of the Mahabharata, beginning with the first book and ending with the 18th book. There are various chapters and books in different parts of the country, which they assembled and edited. And that poem, the PCE, is what I am going to talk about today. And the poem itself states that it begins in Takshashila, Takshila, which is a town in contemporary Afghanistan, as you know. And this place in antiquity was a place of what we would call an institute of higher education or a university town. And in Takshashila, there was this institute, one of the first colleges of higher education in the world, where Buddhist scholars and Buddhist students, shishas, would gather to study the texts and to study the commentaries and to learn the texts. That is what was happening in Takshashila in antiquity. And that's where the poem begins. And that is the old Indo-Aryan homeland. And this Bharata poem is about those people, about those Kshatriyas. It's an archaic text. And that 
developed into what we now know as the Mahabharata. And at some point in the, what I would argue is the third century of the common era, you have a group of Brahmanas. Um, sometime during the Gupta hegemony, who assembled and brought together all these various strands to create what we now think of as the Mahabharata. And that text became a sacred text. It became the basis for what we would, could refer to as heroic religion, where heroes and heroines are worshipped. And the performance of that text, as the Mahabharata states at the beginning and at the end, has moral and spiritual efficacy. And you know this better than I do. Uh, if the Mahabharata is being declaimed at a temple today, that is morally and spiritually efficacious for the audience and for the patron who's paying for or sponsoring that performance. And it is this assembly of Mahabharata materials during the Gupta period, which Sukhtanka referred to as the Bhagava reception because as far as he was concerned, this text was assembled by a group of Brahmins of the Bhagava clan, uh, descended from that Vedic Rishi Burgu. Um, this is what we refer to as the Bhagava reception. So essentially that's what we're looking at today. So when Tharoor says the Mahabharata is the charter myth of contemporary India, um, we could gloss that by saying, well, this is the great Indian classic in that case. And meaning there's something synthetic and profoundly inclusive and timeless about this poem, which allows it to generate the influence and presence of meaning in present, in contemporary Indian 21st century culture. This classic text, like the Homeric poetry for Greece, like the uh, 10 history plays of Shakespeare for Britain, like the Ring Cycle uh, of Richard Wagner in Germany, or like the songs of Bob Dylan for contemporary America. This poem contains many spatial, geographical, economic, familial, political, moral, ethical, forms and paradigms which are influential almost in a genetic sense of meaning in the 21st century in contemporary Indian culture. So that is my general overview. Now let's look at seven particular points which allow us access into this, this document which we refer to as the Great Bharata or which I would consider to be the PCE. So firstly, if you want to understand a community, whether it's in Sikkim or Gujarat or in Ecuador, you want to look at the social elements, particularly the elements of kinship. What, are the, what is the kinship in this community? And in the Mahabharata, you have a clan, a family. And this family, this clan is divided into two sides, what anthropologists call moities. And in one, on one side, you have a king, and a queen, a father and a mother, and their hundred sons. There was no real mention of wives or children. They have a hundred sons, that's it. And the, this side of the clan practice patrilineal descent. Now, on the other side of the clan, you have a mother and her three sons and two stepsons, and the co wife of those five young men, that's Draupadi, Kunti and Draupadi. And this side of the clan practices matrilineal descent. So it is these two groups which contend for the throne at Kurukshetra in this terrible um, apocalyptic battle which destroys almost all the known world. And that battle is what we can refer to as the hypothetical Jaya and it concerns the four central uh, books of the epic, the Kurukshetra books, books six to nine, and along with the Sautika Pavan books 10, which concerns what happens on the night after destruction 
has occurred. And then secondly, this community, this late Bronze Age community which we're examining is both pre-literate and pre-monetary. That is, there's no writing and there's no money. Writing and money are not mentioned in the poem. Now this means not simply that there's no writing and no money. It means that human consciousness is completely different. If you live in a pre-literate society, information is stored and communicated in a completely different fashion from how we store and communicate information, which means that consciousness and emotional life is very different. And in a pre-monetary society, where there is no money, it's not simply that there's a situation of barter, there isn't. What you have is a situation of services being exchanged, what 20th century anthropologists in India call the Yajmani system. And this means that the relationship, what economists call the relationship with the object is very different. Consciousness is again very different. And it is for us as readers, as close readers, to try and understand what's happening in this society before we can actually understand the poem itself and then relate it to 21st century India. Now, <clears throat> what we have is an exclusive genre. There's no architecture in the poem, for instance. Buildings are mentioned, but very casually. We have no sense of what they were, looked like. And despite the fact that in the latter part of the first century of BCE, the first millennium, sorry, the first millennium BCE in India, where Buddhism was flourishing, Buddhism is not mentioned in the poem. It's been censored. It has been excluded. And similarly, the great Indus Valley civilization, this huge sophisticated civilization, which was extant along the shores of the Indus and extended all the way up into Southwest China and down into South East Gujarat and had commercial relations all the way to the West in the Persian Gulf. There's no mention of that, not even of ruins. That has been excluded. And there is no statuary in the poem. There are, is no sculpture. It's an iconic. This is an an iconic society, which means puja is not practiced in the Mahabharata. And in terms of the characters, we have no sense of physiognomy. If you look at a 20th century, 21st century prose novel today, the, the author will tell you, well, this person was dressed like this and looked like this and their hair was like this and spoke like this. In the Mahabharata, there's no sense of individual characteristic, no physiognomy. There's one reference to Yudhishthira having a big nose, that Bhima is very large, that Arjuna is tough. But what we have then is this drama of characters who represent emotionals, their character emotions, their character types. They are emotional types. Um, and Likewise, there are no real rituals mentioned. The rituals are indicated. The poets talk about the Rajasuya and the Ashvamedha and so on, but they don't really know what they're talking about. They're very, very skimpy in how they describe these um, orthoprax events. So if we are going to understand this poem, we have to read very carefully and very closely reading out of the poem, not into the poem. And the Jaya itself, the Bharata, which is about this terrific battle, in, the, in this part of the Mahabharata, where thousands are dying and thousands are experiencing awful violence, there is no pain. And death itself is made beautiful. Death is not like you would have in contemporary cinema or contemporary prose novels. It's not pornographically explicit and revolting. Death is very beautiful. And the death of heroes is receives a terrific range of similes and metaphors like trees, like rivers, or like mountains. So what you have in the, these four central Kurukshetra books is a terrific range of very beautiful poetry and very little narrative because much of this part of the poem is formed of simile and metaphor. Say 70 to 80 percent of these four books is made up of similes. There's very little narrative progress or process. So what we're talking about then is a, 
an extremely artificial world. It's a synthetic world. It never really had historical basis, but it composed of all these very different historical moments, which are assembled into one perfect poem. And this is retrojected into that old heroic age where heroes and heroines walked with the deities, they would dine with the deities, they would make love with the deities sometimes, they would enter into combat on occasion with the deities. And yet, they die. Heroes and heroines die. And actually, many of the heroes and heroines in the poem don't possess mothers. They only have a mortal father. And some of the, these heroes and heroines don't even have a mortal parent. As you know, like Draupadi, they come from the ground or from a fire. So we're talking of this strange, unreal, artificial, retrojected and idealized world. Now, let's turn to our second point, because if you want to look at a community, you want to be able to say, well, this is how time works in the community. If you're reading a novel, or looking at going to the cinema and watching a film, you want to have a sense of the beginning, the middle, and the end. So time in the Mahabharata concerns this idealized late Bronze Age world of the uh, first millennium, and many different aspects of that, as we shall see in a minute, are combined and joined together. And basically, the time concerns the boyhood of the Pandavas, until the maturity of Parikshit. That's the basic unit of time. And this covers, say, 50 years and includes seven generations. And these seven generations are presented in four narrative frames. And we'll talk about those frames in a minute. Now, the poem begins, as we observed, at Takshashila, but it also ends at Takshashila in my end is my beginning. And this is what we call or refer to as ring composition. Where the poem begins, it also ends. And this is very common in pre-literate uh, literature. So what happens then, you have this event at Takshashila, a ritual event, and then the rest of the poem describes what happened which led up to that event, which is what we call in cinema studies a flashback. Most of the poem is in flashback form then. We begin and then we go backwards and we end where we began, having described all the events prior to that moment. That's ring composition. And strangely, if you look at detective fiction, that's what novelists do when they write their books. For instance, um, if you had a crime where the butler was killed and the diamond necklace was stolen and Sherlock Holmes came onto the scene, what Sherlock Holmes would do would be to reconnect all the events which led up to that crime. He would interview people, he would make observations with his magnifying glass, he would sit and watch, and he would connect, he would create this narrative which led to the crime, making a series, joining a series of metonyms, if you like, or creating this metonymy, which established, which led up to that moment where the butler was killed and the diamonds were stolen. So the, what's happening as we read this Sherlock Holmes novel is that Sherlock, we are moving forward in time as we turn the pages of the book, but what Sherlock Holmes is doing is going backward in time identifying all the causal events, the plot which led to that crime. And at the end of the book, Sherlock Holmes would assemble all the people and he would say, aha, Dr. Banerjee, you are the one who killed the butler and stole the diamond necklace because this, 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 and this is what happened. So again, in detective fiction, we have this idea of um, ring composition. In my end is my beginning. And this is how the Mahabharata is organized. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, let me just go for a drink. It's 
extremely hot here in Cambridge today. Pardon me. So, what we have in the Mahabharata is actually a terrific range of narratives. There's not one simple narrative. It's like a cubist painting of Picasso where he would paint the head of a woman from different planes simultaneously. So you'd see the woman's head from various different points of perspective. And that is what the Mahabharata is like. It has these many elements of time simultaneously being delivered. Mythical time, ritual time, astronomical time, pilgrimage time, the 18 days of battle. Um, book 12, for instance, has no time at all. It's completely timeless. There is no reference to time in book 12. That is, this poem is irrational in terms of time, in terms of the temporal. It is non-synoptic. It is a work of what we call bricolage, B-R-I-C-O-L-A-G-E. And a bricoleur is somebody who assembles something from already manufactured materials. He doesn't create a table from uh, raw materials. He finds table leg somewhere, a board somewhere, nails somewhere, and puts it together. And this is what the Bhagava poets, the, accomplished in the Bhagava, what Suptanka refers to as the Bhagava recension, some point during the Gupta period. So you have this work of 18 books of 96 micro-narratives, Upakyanas, which simultaneously presents many different aspects. And it is for us as readers to be able to identify those different moments in time. The fact is, however, that this magnificent work of art is so seamlessly organized that you're not quite aware of this. And that the poem seems to move very simply from A to B to C to D. And this work of bricolage is encyclopedic. It draws in many aspects of tradition. This is what the Bhagavad poets do. They, they took, drew upon many traditions from Bengal, from Gujarat, from Afghanistan, and assembled them into this one poem. And that encyclopedic impulse is typical of what goes to make a classic, what we nowadays refer to as the classic. And the poem itself states that what is not here doesn't exist. It's nowhere else. If it's not in this poem, Forget it, it does not exist. So that is the temporal inclusivity or the synthesis of this poem. Now, we talked about those four frames. Let's just have a look at that. If we are talking about a poem, we need to look at the poetry, the poetics, and the poets, um, and perhaps also their kinds of inspiration. What you have are essentially four, poet, four poets. And the first poet is there at the beginning and there at the end. So we can put him aside for the moment. And these four poets incorporate the old Indo-European poetic traditions, the old Vedic in Iranian traditions, and what we can refer to as early Hinduism or proto-Hinduism. And just as you have in a child's toy, a little doll, and you take the head off the doll, and there's another doll inside, you take that doll out and take her head off, and there's another doll inside that. And you remove that one and take the head off, and there's a tiny little doll inside that one. That is how the poem is organized in terms of frames. One, the larger frame, holding within it the three smaller frames. Now the problem is that once again, we have this irrash, irrational situation where poets in the outer frame actually appear in the inner frames and the poems in the inner frame who are much later actually appear right at the beginning. It, it's in a rational sense, it doesn't work. And yet somehow this poetry does function perfectly together. And Vyasa, who is the creator of the, the poem, the creator of the Bharata or of the Jaya. And I wrote a book about Vyasa, which came out last year called Vyasa Vedus. Strangely, 
Vyasa appears in the poem as a character as well. And he talks to Yudhishthira saying, well, Yudhishthira, this is what's going to happen in the future. Or he will talk to Arjuna saying, don't worry, Arjuna, because this is what happened in the past. And then he will speak to somebody quietly. We don't know what he's saying because the poets say he's informing them of secrets, something which is mysterious and incommunicable publicly. And I've never come across this anywhere else in literature where you have the author, the, the, the creator of the poem, actually appearing as a character and taking on many different qualities and appearing and disappearing. And Vyasa in the Hindu tradition is a chir Chiranjivi. He is still alive. He is walking amongst us today. So he is this very unusual figure in the poem. Um, and I've never come across any figure like this before. It's as if Shakespeare in his 10 history plays would then appear on the stage, talk to the audience, talk to Richard III, talk to Henry IV, and just appear as a character who knew everything that was happening. It's an, an unusual and unique model of creation, poetic creation, which we have with Vyasa. Now, if we're talking about poetry, we should perhaps look at what constitutes poetic inspiration. And in the poem, there are essentially three kinds of inspiration. There is that of Vyasa himself. And at the beginning of the Bharata, at the beginning of book six, Vyasa is said to practice dhyana, which you know is a form of profound reflection or what some people would uh, describe as um, meditation. And then those four books are actually declaimed or sung or performed by a poet called Sanjaya. And Vyasa has given Sanjaya a magical gift. That is, he has the ability to see what is happening miles and miles away. He can also hear what is happening miles and miles away. And moreover, he has a, this telepathic ability. He is able to understand what people are thinking in the distance. And this is the gift of divam, Divyam Chakshu, this divine vision, which Vyasa has given to Sanjaya, which is the basis of Sanjaya's inspiration. And he delivers the four Kurukshetra books using that ability. And then thirdly, we have most of the poem delivered by someone called Vaishampayana. And Vaishampayana is a student, a shishya of Vyasa. And he performs, he recites what he says he has heard Vyasa deliver, proclaim on an early occasion. So in these three kinds of inspiration then, you have the mental, you have the visual, and you have the acoustic. And these three kinds of inspiration, if you care to examine them, tell us different things about the poem. And in a book which I wrote um, in, or published in 2011, I examined this. We don't have time to look, in it, look into it now, but these three kinds of inspiration convey three very different kinds of messages. They concern that which is preliterate, that which is literate, and then something beyond inspiration, which is the work of addition. And it is with those editors during the Gupta times in, say, the third century, who edited these various traditional poems into one great Bharata. Now, let us look at one further particular kind of mnemonic, which is very important in this poem. And it's something that I've drawn from the work of Aristotle in his Poetics concerning his discussion of the Athenian state theater, or what you might refer to as the tragic dramas. Because as you recall, most of what happens in these dramas, in these tragedies, occurs off stage. And what you have on stage is something very different. And this distinction between these two narratives concerns that which is plot and that which is story. The plot is a narrative of causal events. A causes B, causes C, causes D. Whereas the story is a narrative of temporal events. A precedes B, precedes D, precedes E. Um, and in the 
the, the Athenian state theatre, what you have off stage is the plot and what you have on stage is the story. And in the Mahabharata, this distinction is extremely useful for us as close readers to analyze what's happening in this poem and how it has been organized. So if I said the man walked into the bar, took out a revolver and shot the, the chap at the, the table, grabbed the bag, ran outside, flew to Delhi and married the princess. That essentially is the, the plot. If I said, well, one morning, Rohini woke up and looked at her cell phone and realized, oh, there was a message, today's the day. So she rose and bathed and put on a wig and a false mustache and trousers so she looked like a man and went outside. Oh, she took her revolver, which had belonged to her great-grandfather who fought in the Quit India movement. And she went outside, hopped on her motorcycle and went um, down to Connaught Circle where she went into a bar and there was a bag on the table which she carefully picked up. And as she was going, somebody shouted at her and inadvertently she shot that poor man. She went outside, hopped on this motorcycle and went back to her apartment, sent a message, princess married, because in that bag there was a, um, a flash drive containing the secrets for a new computer. That's the story. Now, this distinction between plot and story is very useful for us as analysts because what happens in the poem in terms of plot concerns books two to books 11. The story, however, concerns book one and book books 12 to 18. And the first part of the poem concerns, is centered upon what we have been referring to as the barata, whereas the second part of the story concerns the, what we have been describing as the Mahabharata. Um, and this distinction, which I wrote about in my last book about Vyasa, which came out last year, is a very useful analytical tool for us as close readers to understand what is happening in this PCE, in this uh, Pune critical edition, which came out of the Bandaka Oriental Institute. So we've looked at social situations, we've looked at um, time, we've looked at uh, the poetic structure of the poem. Now, if we're going to examine a community, we need to be able to know how the community regulates itself. That is, what is the, 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 the system of jurisdiction in that community? We need to look at law. And as you know, the word which we can apply here is dharma. And the lack of law or the presence of unlaw is what we refer to, we could refer to as adharma. And aha, problem, because the poem concerns, the, concerns these many different moments in time, many different yugas. And as you know, dharma in different yugas is very different. And not only is the dharma different in yugas, but it applies to different varnas different communities in different fashions. So once again, we have this presence of many different elements which are distinct, which are combined into one narrative. And as Krishna says to Karna on a chariot at the end of the, the Yoga Pava in book five, at this moment, Karna, astronomically, the Kali Yuga is about to begin. And in the Kali Yuga, as you know, Dharma is only possible in one quarter, 25% of everything we do, everything we say, and everything we think. So what is happening in the central part of the poem is a condition where everyone is struggling in a world that is predominantly without Dharma. It is adharmic. And they're all struggling towards some sensibility of the Dharmic. Now, Amartya Sen in his book on justice, and in that book he talks a lot about the Mahabharata, um, in his book he asserts that people don't have a sense of Dharma, not in our community as we know it today. What they do have is a sense of injustice, 
And from that injustice, they make deductions as, what, as to what should be Dharma, what should be right. So if I see some young chap stealing mangoes from my orchard, I think, gosh, that's wrong. These are my mangoes. Therefore, I have a sense of what should be right. Therefore, we should have a law that mangoes should not be stolen. Private mangoes should not be stolen because this, that is right. It is from our perception of injustice through an act of deduction that we come to a sense of justice. And this is how much of the Mahabharata functions, or much of the Bharata functions, sorry. Now, because we have two systems, basically two systems of jurisdiction in the poem. And in one, you have what the ancient Hebrews would describe as an eye for an eye, or a tooth for a tooth, or what the Latins described as lex talionis, the law of retaliation, the metonymy of violence, the, mute, the system of mutual uh, violence, where there is no central system of judgment. There are conventions, there are customs as to how retribution should function. Um, so if my nephew stole the tires of your uncle's automobile, your brothers are entitled by convention to come and smash all my windows. There are these conventions of what in the Eastern Mediterranean would be referred to as vendetta, lex talionis, a law of retaliation. There is no central distribution of judgment or of justice. And this is how justice functions in what we have just been describing as the plot. The, the Pandavas, these five half-brothers and their co-wife Draupadi, feel that they have been wronged. Therefore, they are going to destroy the other half of the family whom we, we refer to as the Dhatarashtras, those hundred sons. That is the system of jurisdiction in this central part of the poem, what we refer to as the plot. Whereas later in the poem, from book 12 onwards, you have a very different system of jurisdiction. You have the prescription of what is right, and this prescription derives from the judgment of a king. So you have these two situations of legality which are functioning in the, uh, in the epic. Now, if you want to understand a community which is very different from you, one of the key signifiers, as any sociologist will tell you, is to look at the place or role of the feminine in that community. Um, and I would argue that the feminine, just as our understanding of what constitutes the male, is not an absolute. Anatomy is not destiny. Femininity is, just like masculinity, is composed according to language and culture. Um, so for us to understand how women are described and how they act in this poem, we need to be very careful readers. We cannot read into the poem from our 21st century feminist point of view and say, well, gosh, look at these women. It's just awful what's happening to them. We need to infer from the poem empirically what is going on with these feminine characters. And some of these feminine characters don't have mortal parents, remember. They are heroines. And there are five kinds of marriage in the poem. Uh, virginity is very often renewable. There are prescriptions as to how menstruation should be dealt with and how abortion should be dealt with. Anatomy is not destiny. We need to be very careful readers if we are to understand how femininity is composed in the late Bronze Age in this place right up in the northwest of. Uh, the subcontinent. And in my 2009 book, I described how certain women in the poem are what I refer to as speakers of truth. It is these women who know the Dharma, and it is the women who tell their menfolk, their husbands and their sons, this is what you should do. And if you don't do this, you are behaving in a fashion that is ah-dharmic. It is the voice of women which 
deliver these Dharmic pronouncements. And the Sri Parvan, the 11th book of the poem, is where I would assert that the epic elements, the heroic elements of the poem concludes when the women perform these formal and very stylized laments for their fallen menfolk, the husbands, the fathers, the brothers, the cousins, etc. Now, there are two particular women in the poem who have terrific presence in terms of sufficient causality, and they are Kunti and uh, Draupadi. And they lie at the very heart of how Veda was caused. And for Kunti, this was because she suppressed the fact that she, her firstborn, should have been king. He was put in a basket and delivered to the river. And Yudhishthira doesn't know about the presence of Karna, who is theoretically the future king. He has been hidden away by Kunti, and she doesn't tell anyone this. And similarly with Draupadi, it is because of Draupadi's abjection and her humili humili hum humiliation, excuse me, in the Sabha by people like Duryodhana and Dushasana that causes her wrath, her anger, and the word is krota. And it is this wrath which is constantly urging her to drive her husbands towards revenge, towards vendetta, to kill Dushasana and Duryodhana and all those brothers. And curiously, it is very telling that both these women have five marital partners each. What does that tell us about femininity? And if you look at the micro-narrative of Nala and Damayanti, Damayanti also has five suitors. So there is something about these central women which has this strange polytropic dimension with their five suitors or marital partners. And just as in the Ramayana, so in the Mahabharata, it is the movement of women, Draupadi or Sita, which actually generates the narrative. And this, it is, this is the same with the, the two Homeric poets, the Homeric Iliad and the Homeric Odyssey. In the Iliad, it is the movement of Helen and then Chryseis and Briseis, which generates the whole narrative of the poem. And in the Homeric Odyssey, it is the position and the potential movement of Penelope which generates the poem. So there's something extremely valuable, high valence about these women in the epic narratives. So we've looked at social situations, we've looked at time, we've looked at poetics, we've looked at jurisdiction, systems of law, we've looked at the place of the feminine. Let us look at the political situation in this poem um, and then begin to draw our arguments together. Politics in the poem concern kingship, as you know, and this concerns centrally Raja Yudhishthira, who is this archaic king. And there are two important qualities about Yudhishthira. One is that he is, exists in a situation which we call diarchic, D-Y-A-R-C-H-I-C. He is a diarchic king, or he participates in dual kingship. And in his case, it, this is with Krishna. Krishna is the figure who makes all the strategic and tactical decisions. He presents policy. Whereas Yudhishthira is the one who is the ritualist. He performs the ritual uh, sacrifices, the Rajasuya, the, uh, the uh, Shastra Yajna, the sacrifice of battle, and the Ashvamedha. And this kind of diarchy is something you see in other archaic systems. You have it in Sparta, in very ancient Greece, and in the early kingship systems of Rome, you have diarchy. And the diarchy later on developed into two roles where you had the king who organized and manipulated violence and you had the priest who controlled the ritual and supernatural world. And the kings had the power, particularly the power of violence, whereas the priests had the power of over the supernatural. Whereas with Yudhishthira and Krishna, you see this joined in a, a diarchic situation. And 
the, those three sacrifices, it is the first one, the Rajasuya, which the poets say was the real cause, the sufficient condition of Beda in the community, because it becomes polluted with bloodshed. Krishna decapitates Shishupala during the ritual, which wrecks the ritual. Yudhishthira is extremely hubristic. The wealth is ostentatious, and this upsets Duryodhana. And then thirdly, you have the gambling ritual, which is part of the Rajasuya, which is subject to treachery or to cheating. So this ritual of the Rajasuya goes awry, and therefore the kingdom goes awry, and you have this conflict, this horrible battle or partition and battle. Now, you also have another kind of kingship, which is running simultaneously, or we can look at it from a different perspective, and that is a fraternal kingship, which again is this very ancient kind of, of uh, system of domination. And you never see Yudhishthira alone without his brothers. They are always talking about what should be done, discussing polity, politics and policy. And Amartya Sen commented on this in his other book, The Argumentative Indian, how in Mahabharata they're always discussing. And it is the brothers, his half-brothers, who are discussing what should be done. And they are in uh, consultation with Yudhishthira. And this kind of kingship I have only ever come across once before. I'm sure it does exist, but for me, it, it is, I can only identify it in the 20th century in Saudi Arabia, where you have a fraternal system of kingship. And the kings in the 20th century in Saudi Arabia are all sons of Ibn Saud, who had many wives and many concubines. So you had a lot of sons. And it is only now, with the 21st century, with that there is the third generation entering the lineage, and that is Muhammad bin Salman. And that kind of fraternal kingship is what you see in the Mahabharata. That is in what we have been referring to as the Jaya or the Bharata or the plot. Because the second half of the poem, as you know, concerns a very different kind of kingship. It concerns a kingship which is monarchic, where a king makes rules, on his own, judges uh, any interference with those rules and punishes those who break the rules. And it isn't, what we have in the poem is a prescription for autocratic rule, particularly in book 12 with the Shanti Parvan. All right then, let's look at our last point and then try and close this discussion because time is running out. <clears throat> now, there is what I like to refer to as the, the navel of the poem, and that is the guitar, um, which you all know better than I do, certainly. Dhamakshetri kurukshetri samaveta yuyutsavaha mamakas pandavas chaiva kimakurvata sanjaya. That's the opening of the, the guitar, um, which is delivered in this timeless capsule on the field of Dharma, on the battlefield, while the two armies are poised before entering into this apocalyptic and totally destructive 18 days of warfare. And this is a speech act. And this is what opens that which we have been referring to as the Jaya, where a super charioteer, Krishna, speaks to his anxious hero. And this relationship between charioteers and heroes is something that I described in, a, in my 2013 book. And charioteers have a particular kind of relationship with heroes, which is unlike any other relationship that heroes experience. It is far more intimate than that relationship between a hero and his wife, or a hero and his father, or a hero and his son. The relationship between a hero and a charioteer is founded upon the mutual experience of death. And that is a cause of great intimacy. And these charioteers, of which Krishna is perhaps the best late Bronze Age description which we have, are extremely sophisticated, very high status individuals. And they are good at managing the horses, because remember, with the hero stands on the left and has is an archer, 
if he has to have a clear shot, the charioteer needs to position the chariot itself so that the hero can fire. The charioteer needs to, needs to have great veterinary skills. Charioteers, or sukas as they're called, are also typically used as ambassadors or as emissaries because they are very good at speaking and they have great gifts of recall. Um, and what happens in the battle is seen by the charioteer. That is, they know the deeds of the hero. So that when you have a situation at the beginning of a battle, and this happens many times in the poem, where the hero looks at the enemy and thinks, oh, I can't do this. He is terrified. His mouth becomes very dry. He, his hands begin to tremble. His head whirls. And sometimes he will swoon and collapse onto the floor of the chariot. And it is the task of the charioteer to restore the hero's morale and battle lust, his tenacity. And he will do this by saying, look, there's Bhishma. You, you remember when you fought against Bhishma and you destroyed him? And look, there's Kana. You remember you, you destroyed Kana and that other battle which we fought in. And this is how the charioteers address their heroes. They restore their morale by describing what happened in the past. Because the charioteer was there and saw it all. They are like the, the cameramen who are in the tank entering the battle. They see everything and they record everything mentally and then re-deliver it. So in a sense, what happens in events like the Gita is hypothetically the beginning of epic poetry because the poet who is the charioteer and they both have the same title, they're both from the same community, they are called Sutta. The, the charioteer sings and proclaims and recalls for the hero his previous deeds. And in a sense, that is the hypothetical origin of uh, epic poetry. Now, in this particular case, you have Krishna also presenting himself as the cosmos. He initiates Arjuna into cosmic mystery. He reveals the cosmos by opening his mouth and Arjuna, who has received this special status, witnesses how the universe functions. This is an act of initiation. And this happens two other times in the poem. Mark Andea describes how he had perceived the theophany of Krishna on an early occasion. And in the, Sabha, in the Udyoga Pavan, Krishna in the Sabha reveals to the assembled kings and heroes his cosmic nature and everyone is terrified. They all close their eyes and crouch down, look away. It's such an unbearable experience. But Arjuna receives this initiation. The problem is later on in the poem, Krishna says, well, Arjuna, you remember when I initiated before and I, I revealed to you the, the, the universe. And Arjuna says, ah, Krishna, I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot. What can you tell me again? And Krishna is very upset because he can't. He was in a state of dhyana, in a state of yoga. So in the book 13, the Anushasana Pavan, Krishna delivers what's called the Anugita. And he doesn't reveal the universe. He describes how he himself was verbally initiated by a brahmana into the cosmic state of uh, the world and the solar system. So as a footnote to this, it is interesting that the Gita was the first translation of the Mahabharata into English, which arrived in America. And that book, that single book, is in a museum just a, a few miles to the west of where I am sitting now in a town called Concord. And in Concord, in the middle of the 19th century, you had what were the beginnings of American literature, uh, particularly informed and infused and generated by two individuals called Thoreau and Emerson. And they had this Gita, and it was profoundly influential upon their thoughts and their understanding of how literature functioned in the community. So at the heart of 
American literature, which began quite late, only 160 years ago, you have this presence of the, the Gita out of the Mahabharata. And I've actually seen this book. It's there in the museum. And if you visit Congo, you can go and see it yourself. It's a nice touch that the, the, the Mahabharata is not simply there at the beginning of Indian literature. It's also present in this rudimentary and very condensed form, what I call the navel of the poem, here in America, at the heart of American literature. So how do we wrap up this? Um, and I can see Dr. Banerjee wants us to close because we're running out of time. <laughs> um, what we have been doing then is reading this poem. It's rather like what children do with those little games they have, a piece of paper with lots of numbers on them, one, two, three, four, five, and they take a pencil and draw lines between one, two, three, four, five, and an elephant appears or a tiger appears. That's what we've been doing. What I have done is to indicate to you what those dots might be. Um, we have done, we have accomplished what we can refer to as an ethnography of the text. We have looked at the text itself as an empirical document and we've made these inferences. When I wrote my book about Karnoff, perhaps, for instance, I, I noticed that Karna was born with earrings. So what I did, and you can do this very easily now, is you just do a word search on, with the online text and you see where earrings appear. And earrings in the poem typically only occur on the head of a decapitated warrior. So the fact that Karna is born with earrings is telling us, if you carefully read the poem, that Karna is attached to this sign of death. And as you know, he dies by decapitation. That is close reading. You look at the dots, you identify the dots in the poem, and you look at them as a total throughout the poem, and that indicates to you what the semantic field generated by those dots are, by those earrings. And if you look at the word dhyana, for instance, it only occurs few times in the poem, but when it occurs, it concerns Vyasa, Krishna, or Bhishma. So that tells us something about how these three characters interact, because this word only occurs when these characters are mentioned. That is close reading. We are being empirical. We, we see how this semantic field is generated. We make our inferences and generate hypotheses and then deliver arguments. And that is all we do as close readers. We don't read into the poem saying this is what happens in the 21st century. Look, what, look at these women, look at these, uh, the nature of uh, juridical contest here, look at the violence. We don't do that. We look at how these actions occur within the poem itself. We make our reading out of the poem. So I hope then that I have indicated for you just a little bit how this jaya, this poem of victory, lies at the heart of contemporary Indian culture and literature and what those possible connections might be. How this poem is, according to Shashi Tharoor, the charter myth or the charter text of India today. Um, oh, you say, well, if it's, this is the charter myth of India, um, therefore there must be a causal relationship between the myth and contemporary society. What, how does literature cause something to happen in culture? A very good question. So if you look at what we can distinguish as the charter myth of modern America, for instance, when those religious refugees at the beginning of the 17th century fled England and came to what we now call Massachusetts, Northeast America, they brought with them a book, the Hebrew Bible, in which there was a narration about a group of people, the Jews, fleeing a tyrannical king and going to the north and establishing a new kingdom, a new Jerusalem, a new Zion. That is the charter myth, arguably, of America today. It's in the 21st century. Or in Britain, you have the uh, the myths of King Arthur and the Round Table. These myths, which are founded upon late 
Celtic stories and poetry combined with early medieval Christianity. Or in modern Greece, you would have the Homeric myth of Odysseus. Now, aha, you say, well, if these myths, these narratives lie at the heart of a culture, even if they're two and a half, three thousand years in the past, if they are there at the heart of the culture, these myths then are inherently conservative. And I think you, you need to ask yourself that. Is, is the Mahabharata as a presence, an influential presence in not simply current Indian literature, but current Indian culture, is it, an, is it simply a conservative influence? And somebody like Purnima Mankeka, who wrote a book about uh, women in the Mahabharata as seen in the cinema, the book's called Screening Culture, she would say that contemporary Indian feminists look to Draupadi as a model, as an icon of their own abjected condition, for instance. Um, so, we have the Mahabharata, we have all these narratives, characters, uh, moral considerations, uh, political types, paradigms of culture, which have come from all that time ago in the past, in the late Bronze Age, and which are with us today in the 21st century. And I hope that I have shown to you then how these Indo-Aryan poetics, which we have identified by close reading, how reading the past informs our understanding of how the present functions. Or, to paraphrase that wonderful and magnificent um, historian of ancient India, uh, Romila Tapa, the past, the past is always before us. So, Dr. Banerjee, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you, sir. Uh, it's an absolute uh, pleasure and honor to have you today. And uh, as you can see in the chat box, uh, there are a lot of comments who say uh, who says that uh, they are spellbound with your presentation. Uh, you please have your water properly. <laughs> we can we can start <laughs> a bit of discussion after you have it. Yeah, I can understand. It's hot here also. It's humid and hot. Uh, basically, I am uh, I am uh, from Guwahati now, and Guwahati is basically a city surrounded by mountains. So uh, uh -huh. we had very bright sunlight today, and it's very hot and humid today. I can understand. <laughs> So, uh, yes, yeah, so, uh, sir, on behalf of Team Gnosis, I thank you for this, uh, such an insightful uh, deliberation on this uh, particular uh, poem and uh, on this particular epic text, Mahabharata, which occupies a very, in, uh, which is an integral and, uh, you know, uh, very, very, occupies a very central and emotional part of our life. So thank you for uh, delving deep into our emotions and uh, uh, trying to analyze it uh, through various perspectives, especially the close reading part that you have done is, is, is something uh, which will deliver, uh, definitely give us some new directions uh, to work on, uh, which is the objective of uh, Gnosis lecture series. Uh, just for the, for the data part, we have uh, had 325 participants who joined us today. And still we have around 270 participants who are with us to, uh, to uh, witness this uh, engaging discussion. As far as Gnosis lecture series is concerned, Dr. Magra, I'll just uh, like to inform you that it is not possible for us and the resource person to answer all the questions. So what we do is we take all the questions in the comment box, we put it in the word file, we send it to the resource person who, if they are willing and if they are free to, can answer at their time and uh, revert it back to us and we will publish in the forthcoming issues of Gnosis, which will be available online which will also serve as a form of uh, archiving for, uh, for our budding scholars. That is our objective. So for the present time, I will just take few questions, few pertinent questions. Uh, I will start, uh, we, uh, I'm happy uh, that uh, I have with me uh, our associate editor of Gnosis, uh, Dr. Indira Nityanandam. She's a retired principal and she hails from Ahmedabad. You talked about Gujarat, so she is from yeah. Ahmedabad, and she has a lot of cultural diversity in her. So, uh, Dr. Indira Nityanandam, our associate editor of Gnosis, over to you, ma'am.
I can't hear anything, Dr. Banerjee. I, I guess she is having some problem. Uh, Dr. Indirani Tanandam? I think, uh, I think that. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, we can hear you, please. Yeah. If, sir, if time permits. But more interestingly, you mentioned that there were no buildings. Ma'am, can you start um, from the beginning? Ma'am, can you start from the beginning? You were not audible. Okay. So can you just start from okay. the beginning? Uh, yeah. uh, Dr. McGrath, uh, thank you very much. You had a spell bound for 75 minutes. Uh, my first question, probably outside the scope of this lecture, but as a student of literature, most of us grew up reading the Iliad and grew up with the Mahabharata as part of our culture. How would you place uh, the two epics, the Iliad and the Mahabharata, uh, in comparative uh, poetics, for example? But uh, more to the point is my doubt about buildings. You said there is not much of buildings mentioned, uh, but uh, my limited reading reminds me of Draupadi in the, in the palace. And there is the story of how she laughs at uh, Duryodhan. There is also the building, remember the one the, in, the, in the forest into which these people are supposed to be burnt. So I just have a doubt about buildings. Were they, according to you, not much mentioned? But so could you please clarify something about that point, sir? Yes. Thank you, Dr. Indira. Um, two very important points, particularly the first one. Um, all my research is, concerns the Mahabharata, but my teaching concerns Homeric poetry, particularly the Homeric Iliad, which is a poem I, I love very much. And I have understood so much of the Homeric Iliad through my readings of the Mahabharata, because the Mahabharata is much more archaic, and it is also uh, much larger than the Homeric Iliad. And then both these poems derive from a very common source which we can identify. So that Achilles, for instance, is very similar to Karna. And you have the a, a diarchy between Agamemnon and his brother, just like you have this dual kingship of uh, Yudhishthira and Krishna. So by reading these two poems, but very carefully and very closely, we can understand much more through this kind of reflection, through this kind of comparison. So it's a very useful instrument for us as close readers, if we're uh, attempting to understand late Bronze Age heroic literature. And similarly, in the, the Homeric Iliad, there is virtually, there's no sculpture, for instance. It's like an iconic culture, just like the Mahabharata. And there's no real architecture. Everything is outside. You have the walls of Troy. You have the, 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 the Sabah where Draupadi is. You have the, the house of luck in the forest. But there's no sense of architecture of what buildings look like. There is only one reference, Dr. Indira, and that concerns when Krishna enters um, in the, the fifth book, in the, in the Fifth book, uh, the uh, Udyoga Pavan. There is a brief couple of lines there which describe the women standing on the balconies and cheering him and proclaiming his arrival into the town. That's the only real architectural description which I have come across in the poem. So yes, there are, there are references to buildings, but we have no idea what those buildings were like. So does that answer your question or your two questions? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McGrath. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. McGrath and Dr. Indira Ma'am. Uh, next question is from somebody who Dr. McGrath is uh, well known to and uh, Dr. McGrath also knows him. He also knows uh, Dr. McGrath very well and they share a very strong bond. It's none other than Dr. Soham. Uh, Dr. Soham has a question. Dr. Soham, over to you, please. Hello. Hello, yes. am I audible, sir? Yes, you are audible and visible, please. Hello, sir. It's a pleasure to see you face to face after so many years. And it was a most enriching and lovely lecture. And uh, I have uh, no words to thank you uh, because uh, I feel really deeply honored and flattered that uh, you accepted this invitation and honored us. Uh, 
Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I have uh, two questions. Uh, the first question is about the role of the supernatural in the Mahabharata. In your lecture, you didn't mention about it. And uh, in your books, you have talked about how uh, Krishna is evocative of Rudra Shiva. And we have all those stories about how Ashwatthama was uh, possessed by Shiva. We have the uh, role of uh, uh, Indra uh, and other gods time to time uh, coming uh, to the aid of the Pandavas uh, and also uh, they have other uh, functions in the story. That is my first question. My second question is uh, whether uh, we can have any uh, fixed uh, relation between Draupadi and the Pandavas and the idea of Dharma. Because if they are the upholders of dharma and Draupadi is the speaker of dharma or of truth, then what does the narrative voice uh, say uh, about uh, the final um, outcome of the battle where they are also rendered childless and they are in a very pitiful condition at the end of the war? So uh, are they on the side of dharma or on the side of the adharma? that those are my two questions. Thank you, sir. Hello, Soham. It's wonderful to see you after so long. And let me inform everybody that Soham, Dr. Soham, was a, a most esteemed and wonderful presence in the Harvard Mahabharata seminar uh, for almost a year, um, a while ago, when he was visiting America. So lovely to see you, Soham. Um, so two questions, the supernatural. Well, the, we live in a secular world in general, and certainly in the West we live in a secular world, but in the late Bronze Age, there is no idea of the non-secular. There's no idea of atheism. So everything is not simply natural, but supernatural. The world is a world of natural and supernatural forces, which are not distinguished because there is no, nothing secular in this, in, in that culture, so on. Um, and this is very difficult for us as teachers to introduce to our students, as you know, because they live in a secular world where the idea of individual autonomy and uh, material practice and scientific method and atheism is common. Whereas in late, the late Bronze Age world, that, that is not the case. There's no sense of atheism. There's no sense of the non-secular. Um, there's no sense of, the, of the, the secular, sorry. So the supernatural world of the wind, of the rivers, of poetry, of um, human affection is there. It's not something which is distinguished from the natural. These are not separate elements. And concerning Shiva, I would like to argue, and this is an opinion because I have no evidence here, this is not an, actually an argument, it's an opinion that Rudra, Shiva, is a deity who, or a divine force, which, who was present in the Indus Valley civilization and who has been incorporated into the pre-Hindu or the Vedic world and then the the later Hindu world. So Shiva is this, or Rudra, Rudra Shiva for me, has been incorporated into the model of Krishna by these Bhargava editors. That's how I see it. But as I just said, this is an opinion. This is not an argument. I have no, no evidence for this. And then concerning your other point about Draupadi and Dharma, and the fact that at the end of the poem, everything is lost. Well, remember that at the beginning of Kurukshetra, the world of the Kali Yuga or the time of the Kali Yuga begins. And in the Kali Yuga, Dharma only exists in one quartile, in one 25th percent of all action, speech, and thought. So that everyone exists animals and birds and fish and human beings in a situation where the Adamic is preponderant for 75% of all action, speech and thought and time. So yes, 
the the the, the Pandavas are trying to be Dharmic, but they live in a world which is predominantly Adharmic. Therefore, they cannot succeed. They cannot succeed in uh, arriving at a condition that expresses Dharma. So does that answer, answer your point, Soham, or two points? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's great to see you again. Thank you, sir. Uh, next question is uh, from Dr. Amod Kumar Rai. He's an assistant professor in Kushinagar, uh, Buddha land uh, in Uttar Pradesh, India. Uh, Dr. Amod Kumar Rai, please ask your question. Well, thank you, Saikat. Am I audible to all of you? Yeah, audible and visible. Please carry on. Am I audible to all of you? Yes. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. Thank you very much. So, First of all, let me extend my Sadar Pranam to you, Professor Kevin Magrath. Uh, it has really filled us with great pleasure that you have mustered huge energy and time in your, in your study of this magnum opus of Indian literature. But Professor, uh, there are certain points where I wish you to reconsider your convictions once again in the larger context. First, as it has been raised by Indra Madam, there is description of architectural splendor in Mahabharata. Uh, for instance, he uh, pointed out two places where Mahabharata gives references to the architectural skill of that time. One is the Indra Prast Palace and second is the Lakshagri. Third is the Dwarka Bhish Palace. Uh, it has been also beautifully described in great detail. Uh, second thing is, Professor, there is uh, uh, physiognomy also in uh, Mahabharata, although you mentioned that there is less uh, emphasis on the character portrayal of uh, uh, characters in the Mahabharata. But uh, let me tell you one thing, uh, there is physiognomy in the description of trade and marshalling efficiency of characters. Yes, the physics description lacks pencil sketching from tip to two, but there is much emphasis on the uh, muscular power of Bhim, then uh, of Karna, of Duryodhan, even of Dushashan too, there, uh, there are descriptions. And one thing which I am reminded of by your assumption, that Mahabharata lacks these two things, uh, V.S. Naipaul also alleged uh, Mahatma Gandhi for not referring to the external beauty on his first voyage towards London in his the autobiography of, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Mahatma Experiment. Gandhi's book, uh, My Experiments with Truth, My Experiments with Truth. Uh, Naipaul Ellis, the same thing. Actually, these scripts are doing something uh, different. They are not uh, there for uh, uh, describing the physical uh, shape of the characters. Rather, they are uh, dealing with the dharma aspect and they have to show between the of characters, consciousness of characters. This also relates to the third point. The Mahabharata is not just an idealized and synthetic world. Rather, it is a combination of little surrealistic and practical world because it intends to teach us dharma. Now, dharma is a subtle thing. And you have referred to Shashi Tharu twice in your lecture for his uh, understanding of Mahabharata. I would like to extend an advice, although I don't think I deserve this to you. But Guru Charan Das has also made an extensive study of Mahabharata in his phenomenal book, The Difficulty of Being Good. There he has elaborated this point very beautifully, ki how Mahabharata deals with the practical world. And uh, Guru Charan Das has related the problems of Mahabharata with the contemporary Indian scenario also. Then uh, you have referred to two characters, Yudhishtha and Krishna, in reference to politics making in Mahabharata. Shakuni is equally also an astute character who has shaped the political agendas of Mahabharata. These are certain points, Professor, on which I would like to hear more from you. Thank you very much from my point. Well, thank you so much for all those wonderful questions. Uh, I don't know how quite how to begin. <laughs> Let me say that um, Bucharan Das is a friend of mine and I admire his work profoundly. And we've discussed uh, his books on many occasions. He, he is a great man, and I love his uh, editorial in the Times of India. Um, so, architecture. 
Well, I suppose my counterpoint to that statement which I made was if you look at uh, modern literature where architecture is described, or if you look at um, architecture in 19th century novels or in cinema, in the Mahabharata, it's, it's not really described. We, one couldn't draw any of those buildings, for instance, from the descriptions which are delivered in the PCE, maybe in the text which you are reading there is more description. And similarly with physiognomy, I don't know what Draupadi looks like, I have no sense. But um, in the novels of Vikram Seth, for instance, I know what those characters look like. I know the sound of their voices. I know how they dress. This is not apparent in late Bronze Age literature, typically. It's the same in Homeric poetry. We don't know what those buildings were like. We don't know what Achilles or Homeric Odysseus were really like. Um, and the fact that the poem is synthesized, it's an artificial world. Um, it is artificial in the sense that it doesn't describe an historical place or time or culture. It is synthetic, it draws together many elements. And that world is not like how you would describe, say, uh, the, the world in a contemporary no novel. All I'm describing, describing, though, is the PCE, the Sanskrit text. That's all I'm familiar with. I don't have the benefit of your education, which has grown up with the Mahabharata. You know far more about it than I do. So let's leave the, the point that you're very decent and very valuable points there because in a sense I'm not quite competent to answer your questions. All I'm dealing with is this very limited Sanskrit text and what I have described is what I have perceived. So thank you for your, your points, they're very useful. Thank you Dr. Amos sir. Uh, thank you Amos sir and thank you uh, uh, Professor McGrath, we take the last question. And uh, this question is from a very budding scholar from the south of India. Uh, that is, uh, she is doing her research from University of Madras. She is a research scholar in Department of Women's Studies. Swithal Ramachandran. Yes, Swithal, please carry on with your question. Yes, thank you, Saikat, sir. Uh, good evening, Dr. McGrath. Uh, thank you so much for the very insightful lecture uh, with different perspectives. And I'm so impressed by how we have mastered the epic as well as the shlokas. Uh, so, sir, my question is, uh, what is your take uh, on the question of right and wrong and the justification of choices made by various characters when it comes to the open-ended question of who was indeed responsible for the Great War? Ah, thank you for a wonderful question, um, a very difficult question. Who was indeed responsible for the Great War? Who was indeed responsible? Well, there's a sequence of causality. You could say that Kunti was responsible because she hid the fact that Karna was the first form and should be the rightful king. He is the future king. You can say it is the hubris of Yudhishthira who is responsible because he was so ostentatious in his performance of the Rajasuya um, that the Dhatarashtras, the brothers of Duryodhana, were appalled. You could say that Vyasa is responsible because Vyasa is the creator of the poem and he is in total control of the narrative. Um, and therefore, just as an, any author is in control or any poet is in control of what they are performing. Um, Vyasa is doing this for a purpose. We're dealing with what we call metaphor. Why is Vyasa telling us this song? What is this, this song about? Um, in my book about Bhishma, I argued that Bhishma was profoundly culpable um, in the the sufficient conditions which led to the destruction of the kingdom. And 
I argued in a nutshell there that Bhishma had a particular relationship with Krishna, which was founded upon dhyana. And that if you read my book, um, and this is the uh, 2018 book, Bhishma Deva Vrata, they communicate, Krishna and Bhishma communicate telepathically. It, it's, it's, it's very strange. And these two characters are the ones who control the narrative, if, or narrative in the sense of the plot. It is through their commission and through their silence that the plot develops as it does. And if you identify those moments where Bhishma and or Krishna are dominant in how the plot or the trajectory of the plot is moving, they are there, therefore in uh, control of the narrative. Um, but my final point goes right back to the beginning where we talked about kinship systems and the, the clan who succeeds at the end of the poem um, is not the, the clan of the Pandavas nor the Dhritarashtras, it is the Yadavas who succeed because genetically the person on the throne in, at uh, Hastinapura and the person on the throne at uh, Indraprastha are predominantly Yadava because the Pandavas practice matrilineal descent and Kunti comes, is, is from, comes from the family of Krishna. So it's not the Kauravas, this ideal uh, clan, who develop into the Pandavas and the Dhritarashtras, they do not succeed at all. It is Krishna, the Yadavas, who end up on the throne at Hastinapura and at um, Indraprastha. And Dr. Um, Pradeep Bhattacharya, uh, who for me is the most superlative of uh, Mahabharata, Sanskrit Mahabharata scholars in India at the moment, has argued this very strongly. So does that answer your, your, your point? Yes, sir, indeed. And I'm looking forward to reading your new book. So thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Magrath, on behalf of Team Gnosis, I, am, I really feel great honored that you, are, you have sat with us. You have discussed this magnum opus for the last 95 minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Magrath, from the entire team of Gnosis from India. And uh, please keep well, stay safe and bless us so that we uh, go ahead more stronger day by day with this Gnosis lecture series. Blessings from people like new, from uh, erudite scholars like you uh, will do us a lot of good, Dr. Magra. So thank you once again. Yes, Dr. Magra, please, your closing. Dr. Day. Banerjee and Dr. Soham, thank you so much for inviting me and thank all of you who have participated today. And I would request your blessings in this time of terrible pandemic, where in America we've had over 110,000 deaths so far. Um, and I hope this does not reach India in the same kind of magnitude. So ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Banerjee, Dr. Soham, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much.